In August 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed about an America where children would be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. Jim Crow laws are long gone, but in Oklahoma, growing up as a black person is still challenging, half a century after the March on Washington. The extent of progress made in civil rights since Dr. King's landmark speech depends on which generation of African Americans you talk to. African Americans seeking a new life after slavery were among the thousands who rushed into Oklahoma territory during the land runs of the late 1800s. But bigotry and the Ku Klux Klan came with them, forces that eventually left Tulsa's Greenwood District in ruins following the most deadly race riot in American history. Growing up black in Oklahoma through the 1960s meant seeing things like this, but a favorite story of historical society curator Bruce Fisher illustrates how much things have changed. I've seen kids playing with those fountains, trying to make water come out of them, which it won't, the captain, of course. And I was looking at two kids playing with it one day, and finally the other kid asked the other, well, what color is the water supposed to be? They didn't know that this color had anything to do with who could drink out of one fountain and who couldn't. One of Fisher's concerns is that the current generation of African-American children do not know the struggles their ancestors went through to produce the life that is available for them today, a concern shared by State Representative Mike Shelton. When I was in 10th grade, I was able to take uh, African-American uh, history as an elective. I don't believe you can take that today as an elective, and it's bad. People need to know where they come from. Casey Ferguson is a 23-year-old production assistant at OETA. She has a degree in broadcast journalism from Langston University. Most of my knowledge of black history and Tulsa and Oklahoma history, just period, came from my grandparents and my family members, just common conversation. And Students at Star Spencer High School also say they have had little exposure to black Oklahoma history. We actually had to do um, a report um, black history, and I found the little stuff, but not too much. Not about African Americans, but I know about Indians. Maurice Clark grew up without a father. He got involved with street gangs. Now, he's a supervisor at the Oklahoma County Juvenile Detention Center. If you asked me 10 years ago, where would you be? I would probably say in jail. I remember telling my mom, I didn't need a dad. I remember saying that, I don't need a dad. He doesn't have to come around. And as I grew older and I started having children of my own, I actually realized the impact that a father has. Clark sees firsthand every day how easy it is for young black people to start down the same bad road he once took. You know, where's your dad? Or what does he do? He's incarcerated. Um, and we have some here that have both parents and still follow stray. But I think a majority of of the people that I come in contact with, the teenagers, don't have anybody. Um, and they usually turn to gangs. You have instances that you really can't control. But you have some instances that you can control your actions, the things you do, the choices you make. But we make horrible choices. Um, and then in the end, we will blame a lot of people except for ourselves. Petra Woodard refuses to accept that blame game from her students at Star Spencer High School. That's where she's a counselor. Excuses are the tools of the incompetent. They build monuments of nothingness, and those who dwell on them are seldom good for anything else. I made my students learn that. It was a teacher who made a lifelong impression on Miss Woodard, a teacher better known as the mother of the sit-in, Miss Clara Looper. Miss Looper's class, you came in and you were expected to learn. There was not an out. You were expected to communicate. You were expected to take ownership of your grades, of your behavior, um, and you were expected to take whatever she taught you outside of the classroom. I, one of my tasks is to get students to know themselves so well, it's not going to matter how people view them because they know themselves so well. They know what they have, they know what they can offer. Maya Paxson is a 15-year-old sophomore at Star Spencer, and like Maurice Clark, Maya grew up without a father. He kind of just threw away me and all my brothers and sisters. He put them up for adoption, and he just pretty much abandoned them. And I just found all of them, just recently found all of them. And if it wasn't for my grandma and my aunts, 
don't know what my mom would do. They basically take care of us. Ebony Cornelius is a 16-year-old junior at Star Spencer. Her mother died earlier this year from breast cancer, so she has new responsibilities at home helping take care of two younger sisters. Again, extended family is stepping up to help. My auntie, she moved in with us and she actually, you know, just started pitching in, taking care of the kids, and she cooked for us every day, you know. 17-year-old Terrence Franklin sees the world from both sides. I'm black and white, so I grew up with it early, so I was introduced to the hate thing early, so it wasn't like, you know, when I leave my black family, I have to go to my white family, so I, you know, hear it in both ears, so, I mean, you're not really, being racist isn't like a, it's not something you feel, it's just what you talk. You, know, you don't come into the world being bad. Terrence grew up with his grandmother, now living with his aunt. When I was young, my dad, he uh, went to jail, so. And uh, my mom, I didn't really know it like that. She just like left, so. I just met her like four years ago. For many growing up black in Oklahoma, today still means facing racial discrimination. I've actually walked past people and they've done things like pull their purse or lock their door. They treated us completely different. It was an all Caucasian school. Me and my sister, I think, was other two other kids, only black people in that school. They treated us way differently. I come in contact with a manager or something that's white, and they'll think I'll be talking about, you know, my schooling and, you know, AP classes, SAT, stuff like that, and they'll belittle me like I'm just like not even close to as smart as them just because I'm black, just because I look differently than them. I'm not as smart. And that's, you know, it happens everywhere I go. And for 17-year-old Naya Holloway, once she completes her education in Oklahoma, she plans to leave. Yeah, really go. <laughs> Gotta leave. I want to see different things, different people. 17-year-old Isaiah Flowers has developed his own way of dealing with being treated different. Just Try to live right, try to, like, try to do everything right. Don't try to get in any trouble. Just try to live perfect, even though it's not possible. Just try to be perfect. Like, I don't want to like be another number. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. While Oklahoma has now not reached the, the world envisioned by Dr. King Rise during his I Have a Dream speech, Life today is a far cry from Oklahoma of the early 1900s or even the 1960s. And in some instances, young black men are now being judged by the content of their character. Both of my sons are D1 athletes and I'm most proud because they were recruited on their character. Yeah, they're good students, they have good grades, but their coaches are most proud of the type of athlete they were getting. And so to me as a parent, that's what I want, and that's what I want for my students here.